Now, living with telecommunication. The second of two talks by Professor Colin Cherry. Modern communications let us talk freely to absent friends, give us the pleasure of watching colourful events in foreign countries, and may even allow us to speak to men on the moon. On the other hand, they could also allow us to build a world modelled on Orwell's 1984. As Professor Cherry explained in his first talk last night, if we want to predict how mankind may use the new freedoms given him by modern communication technology, we must look beyond mere equipment. For example, do we really know the true meaning of communication and technology? Technology isn't just a study of things, Professor Cherry argued, but rather a study of things in relation to people, and people vary. So the criteria of success of technology is social and flexible, not rigidly scientific. As for communication itself, it certainly allows us to send messages to each other, but more fundamentally, it enables man to belong to different social, political and economic groups. In this talk, Professor Cherry looks at the global implications of modern methods of communication. In particular, can we expect much autonomy in the ordered world of tomorrow? Every year shows addition to international and intercontinental means of communication. New oceanic cables, new satellites, a new airline. Will these bring us closer together or drive us apart? Even to discuss such questions lays one wide open to misunderstanding because communication is a highly emotive word and one which affects our feelings of security. Mention the word overseas broadcasting and back comes the reply propaganda. Mention the press and you are challenged with the words advertising or slanted news. How can one argue rationally within this field so filled with cliché and prejudice? For a start, it is absolutely essential to recognize that all media of communication serve two distinct functions. These may be termed the private and the public, or the domestic and the institutional, or more broadly the emotional and the organizational, corresponding to one's inner personal life and to the structure of one's society. And it is the latter, the organizational value of the media, that seem to me to dominate the future, not the emotional values. Certainly, radio and television, books and newspapers, telephones and the post, can affect your emotions profoundly. But your particular feelings will depend upon who you are, your particular circumstances, your particular views of the world and of yourself as your own social institutions have taught you. From such a point of view, emotions are seen not as primary causes, but rather as consequences of the particular freedoms of action or frustrations that bear upon one within one's society. It is, then, the enormous power for organizing offered us by communication media today and in the future that seem to me of primary value and importance. They are for us the potential for forming and operating many new types of organization, especially on a global scale. These powers have not yet been taken up internationally in very great diversity. Certain forms of international industry have grown fast since the Second World War. For example, the news services and the airways, both being dependent upon the international teleprinter service. The transatlantic telephone service has led to new kinds of industry and business having legs on both sides of the ocean. One thing is certain about the future. The realization of what the new telecommunication techniques can offer will encourage more industries to become increasingly dispersed around the globe. One major obstacle is likely to be the frustration upon international trade and industry already being caused by the inadequacy of a particular medium of international communication, a workable international currency system. But this is typical of the various media of communication. They are not all equally progressed and constrain our actions industrial or political, unevenly. Ownership of the greater part of the global communication systems of today lies in the hands of the affluent Western countries. Only they, at present, can afford the necessary capital. Furthermore, 
it is cheaper for these richer countries to use these systems because their traffic demands are higher. A kind of capitalism of communication may then develop because communication, if regarded as organizing power, like money, can create itself. That is, unless some means are found to control the explosion and to divert some of this power to the service of the poorer developing countries. Fortunately, there is a long and fairly happy tradition of international cooperation in communication services. Over a century ago, the postal services and the telegraphs were organized on an international basis in ways which have not substantially changed since. Modern long-distance communication services do present new problems, mainly financial, but the international organization needed to own, operate and use them is working fairly well. There is no denying the fact that, at present, it is only the advanced countries which have the technical potential and the capital needed to design and install the major global systems. It is only they, too, who have the traffic demands to justify the creation of such systems. We can speak lightly of world communication, but we should remember that the bulk of the traffic is at present confined to one particular route. Eighty percent of all the world's intercontinental telephone traffic passes between North America and Europe. However, the communication channels themselves are not confined to the North Atlantic, for within the past few years, complete round-the-world installations have been introduced connecting all the continents, and so they're available for the less rich countries with all their present low demands for international traffic. I've used the expression developing countries. What is a developed or an advanced country? The difference lies not so much in our possession of things, but rather in our different concepts of trust. In a developing country, people may each place their trust in specific individuals who they know and communicate with personally. Whereas in a so-called advanced country, we place trust also upon abstract institutions and upon their representatives, who we may never meet personally. We trust the manager or the secretary or the inspector, unknown to us as persons. And when our institutions fail this trust, we are, of course, righteously indignant. Industrialization requires this essential extension to the people's concept of trust. One of the great values of modern communication media could be to help with this change within developing countries. But unfortunately, they are expensive, not only to install but to operate day by day. The United Nations has stressed in numerous reports the importance of countrywide communication services for developing countries, especially the media of the press, radio and film and even television, and has laid down minimal targets. The UN has urged the importance of these media, not only for the development of national institutions for economic growth, government and education, but for assisting change in people's attitudes and for instilling the sense of a nationhood. And what is a sense of nationhood but a feeling of trust in one's own national institutions? We, in the so-called developed countries, take this state of affairs for granted and can so easily forget that a large part of the world does not yet live with such feelings of security. We may too easily scorn nationhood and speak of it as something undesirable by confusing it with nationalism. In the advanced industrial countries, it can well be that we've carried the process too far by now, in the sense of becoming over-centralized. Roads and railways first enabled areas of economic action to expand and central government to operate over whole countries. The coming of telegraphs and telephones continued this process by extending and tightening central control. The press, radio and television carried it further. And it's certainly true to say that our technologies of communication have so far led to a very great increase in centralization, which has, of course, advanced us economically. So far, it has been the price to pay here in order to grow richer. However, 
It would be a great mistake to take the gloomy view that communication media inevitably lead to increased centralization alone. They can do and they have done at first. But their very same powers also offer us in principle the ability to decentralize. Centralization and decentralization needn't be antagonistic. We can have both at the same time and they can be mutually advantageous. Increase in strength of national government needn't necessarily weaken local government, even though up to now this seems to have been the case. In my opinion, we are now at a watershed. We are beginning to develop the decentralizing powers of our communication media, and the values of these, once they are seen by people, will be increasingly demanded. The point is, we don't have to be members only of one community. We can identify with two or with many. We may be members of a large community for certain general purposes, but at the same time, we can identify with smaller communities for local or personal purposes. For example, to join Europe for general economic purposes of that enlarged community doesn't require us to shed all aspects of being British. Union doesn't mean uniformity, nor does it mean some colossus of over-centralized power. It means searching for and separating out those elements of common interest over the years. The communication explosion may lead some people to fear this colossus of over-centralization, though it were some inevitable creation of our expanding technology. Now, if it happens, which I myself obviously doubt, the fault would lie in ourselves because centralization isn't inherent in the physical communication media themselves. The reason why so many may have such fears arises from the early history of the communication explosion, which has witnessed great and rapid growth of centralization in many forms. We have seen rapid expansion of many areas of tight control and influence at many different levels and with varied organizations. I'm thinking here not only of government, but of areas created also by unified, say, educational systems, or by national broadcasting, or by the press, and other forms of so-called mass communication, or in other parts of the world, by widespread recognition of common distress or frustration. Now, the mid-20th century has seen other forms of centralization, however, such as the remarkable growth of such international organizations as the World Health Organization and the IMF, or UNESCO, each of these with a precise and prescribed function, federating different groups of countries according to their functional needs. At the same time, the mid-20th century has witnessed another phenomenon, that of decentralization, in the appearance of many new and very small nations each seeking to run such of its own affairs as are unique to its people and their own feelings of identity. It is a sobering thought that half the countries of this world have less than five million inhabitants, say half the population of London. The leading question is, therefore, how can we rationalize these apparently opposing drives towards centralization and decentralization, and what part does world communication play? I do not believe that the real contributions of global communication to world order in the future will arise from their emotional powers, at least not directly. We shall get nowhere by trying to persuade the Chinese to stop being Chinese and be like us. Any attack upon the institutions or communities with which a person identifies and his belongs is an attack upon himself. By all means, let us have criticism if that can really be informed criticism and not, as more usually, self-justification. The real positive values of our rapidly increasing powers of world communication are practical ones, stemming from their organizing powers. It is now possible, technically speaking, to organize many institutions on global scale for specific purposes, if we wish. Certainly, when any new technique of communication has been introduced in the past, its first applications have usually been to warfare or money-making. But there is some evidence to suggest that, in the past, the development of more fruitful international institutions has been frustrated, partly by lack of adequate technical media and channels of communication. 
Whether the will or the way comes first is difficult to say, but it is noteworthy that the way of which I am speaking, is world communication, has swept on its upward path alongside evidence of growing will, by which I refer to the remarkable increase in the number of international organizations. The first such organization was a result of the Treaty of Vienna, when the crowned heads of the European states met following the Napoleonic Wars. Among the questions dealt with was uh, who owned the rivers of Europe, for the same water flowed through several countries and were shared both as a stuff and as a value. During the 19th century, the number of international organizations grew as different specific interests became identified. But the First World War more or less saw a collapse of the whole process. It was only after the Second World War, only 25 years ago, that the growth began again in a world so needing it, and in a way truly explosive, to use that word yet again. We now have some two and a half thousand organizations, each dealing with specific and defined interests common to various overlapping groups of countries whose representatives share a common expertise though they may belong to countries of varied political systems. They deal with the practical constraints of life, of trades, of law, of scientific knowledge, of navigation, flying, of health and many others each having a separate and defined function, each of common interest and overlapping various national boundaries, and there seems as yet no check to their growing numbers. As I see hope for the future then, it is not through enforced shedding of national autonomies or political differences or cultural distinctions and by creation of centralized governments based on analogy with our concept of national government. For what unthinkable extent of a bureaucracy and concentration of power would an over-centralized organization of this kind imply? And under what political system would a world government operate? The United Nations is an institution which is sometimes spoken of as a potential world government. But in fact it is not. It was not created as such, and it has never set out to be so. It does indeed provide a talking house and an organized secretariat, but to compare its debates with the operation of, say, the House of Commons could only lead us to endless disappointments. To express my personal view, the great practical value of the United Nations organization lies in the existence of the specialized agencies. Rather than through the hypothetical centralized world government, I see the possibility of better world order through varied and flexible federations of countries according to a host of specific mutual interests. That is, through continued growth of the international organizations, leading to great dispersal of power in many different forms and varied functions, as these become identified and defined. And it is to this end that the technology of world communication allows us to go if we choose. And it is along such a path that our emotional attitudes to one another in this world have at least some chance of converging. <laughs>